Um, I, I really didn't put my happiness as a priority at all. I, I truly believed that like if he came home from work and he was doing well and was being successful, that that would just like somehow, I don't know, come inside of me. And so for, you know, we had kids and a few years after that, I just started to notice mm-hmm. that I really wasn't very happy a lot of the time. And I really was kind of um, snappy and getting upset over stupid things that didn't really matter and noticing that like, I don't have any of my own hobbies and I don't really enjoy, even know what I enjoy doing. Hey everybody, welcome back to this meaningful life. I am your host, Stacey Urig. So today I have with me Karen Nelson, and I'm just going to read her bio real quick before we get started. Karen is a divorce confidence coach. She's helping moms move past the misery of their broken marriage, helping them redefine their life after divorce. Karen went through her own divorce five years ago after a 20-year marriage and has since reinvented herself. She's been helping women through her coaching practice and her podcast, Becoming You Again, to live a happy, independent life after divorce. Karen has two kids, three cats, is a mystery lover, a puzzle enthusiast, a Taylor Swift fan, and she lives in Northern Utah. So welcome, Karen. How are you today? I am doing amazing. How are you? I'm really good. I can't complain. So you and I had a chance, I'm just going to try to adjust this light a little bit. You and I had a chance to connect within the last two weeks or so, and you shared your story with me and it was really fascinating. And I was wondering if we could just kick it off by you just sharing what it was, what was the challenge that you felt you had to overcome in your life that helped transform you into who you are today? Yeah. So ultimately, I think my biggest challenge has been my divorce. I mean, I was married for 20 years. I got married when I was 19 and it was basically the one and only main relationship I had ever had. And so when I you know, was faced with this divorce and this decision to divorce, it was a scary prospect. And to think about what my life was going to look like after that I mean, I had no idea. I didn't even know. I went from living in my parents' house to living in my married house. And so I didn't even know what that would look like, like being on my own, what it would look like being a mom on my own and trying to co-parent with my ex and trying to figure out who I was in the process of all of that. So I have a few questions. So you said this was the only person you had dated. So how old were you when you got married? I was 19. Then it wasn't the only person I had dated, but it was for sure the the most connected, longest relationship that I had ever had. Okay. And was it common in your community to get married that young? Yeah, very common. So I was raised Mormon or LDS, depending on who you are and how you want to say it, um, which basically is a religion. It's a very prominent religion in Utah, which is where I live and where I grew up. And it's very, it's really common actually for girls to get married, you know, a year or so after high school, it's not an unusual thing to happen. In fact, most of my friends that I went to high school with got married about a year out. And so it wasn't like I was going through high school planning on getting married that young, but when I met my husband, you know, my boyfriend at the time when I met him, uh, it wasn't unusual for us to move very quickly from dating to engagement to getting married a few months later. And it wasn't like weird or, you know, strange or, you know, people weren't looking at us going, Oh no, what is this decision that they're making? It was, this it was, was normal. Common. Yeah. Pretty common. Yeah. And so you're married and this is a great decision for you. It's a very comfortable decision for you. Do you have kids right away at 19? We don't. I wanted to wait. And I think he did too. I think we kind of wanted to go to school and kind of get our feet into, you know, the direction of where our life was headed. And so we waited until I was about 23. He was a couple of years older than me about, he was like two and a half years older than me. So we waited and then we had my first daughter when I was 23, almost 24. And then three years later, we had our son. Um, And we both went to school during that time and worked and, you know, 
we had a good relationship. It's not like this whole marriage was the most terrible thing, but I definitely had a story in my head that I had picked up somewhere, grown up with, not sure exactly where it came from, but um, if my husband is happy, then I will be happy too. And so I went into this relationship, went into this marriage, really with that idea in mind of I'm going to support him and whatever you know job he wants to have, I will just support him in his job and I'll stay home with the kids and I'll you know be here at the house raising, you know, taking care of the home and raising our kids. And he's gonna have this amazing job and he's gonna have this amazing career and we're gonna be here to support him and he'll be happy and then we'll be happy, you mm-hmm. know, because of that. And it was a rude awakening for me to realize, wait a minute, that is actually not how happiness works. And so So I have a few questions for you. First of all, who was, who was making you happy? Like if if your job was to support him and to make his life really comfortable, which inherently we think would make someone happy, whose job was it to make you happy? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I really didn't put my happiness as a priority at all. I I truly believed that like if he came home from work and he was doing well and was being successful, that that would just like somehow, I don't know, come inside of me. And so for, you know, we had kids and a few years after that, I just started to notice Mm -hmm. that I really wasn't very happy a lot of the time. And I really was kind of um, snappy and getting upset over stupid things that didn't really matter and noticing that like, I don't have any of my own hobbies and I don't really enjoy even know what I enjoy doing. And so I would follow his hobbies and do kind of the things that he enjoyed, even though it wasn't really making me happy in any way. And I just kept thinking, but if I, if I just keep supporting him and doing this thing, that happiness will come at some point. And it really didn't. And so the other questions I have for you, I have so many questions for you. Number one, was he happy? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and if he was not happy, did that tell you that you shouldn't be happy? Yeah. Often I would mirror the emotion, the, whatever he, his emotion was, I would mirror it. And I, mm. I didn't know any of this at the time. This is all things that I can look back of on course. that I've learned since, right? I just didn't understand, you know, what was going on. I didn't understand that I had to create my own happiness. And that was for me to discover for myself. And he was very good at discovering, at least through his own hobbies, what made him happy. He was really good at that. And so when he was out, you know, pursuing a hobby or pursuing a job that he really loved, there was that happiness for him. And, and I'm not saying my entire marriage was terrible. And I was so, you know, sad every moment. Of course, that wasn't it. But there wasn't a discovery for myself in that relationship of who am I, what do I truly want and how can I create that? Mm. And go ahead. So well, the question I have for you is, I have so many questions. The You had mentioned earlier on that this was very common for for couples to get married very, very young. And so you had a handful of friends that were obviously living by a a similar set of unspoken rules, right? It's just an understanding. So was there any discussion amongst the young women who were all in their 20s with these young children, all kind of living by the same philosophy? Was there any discussion among each other about how you were feeling? No. In fact, it's really interesting that you say that because I really loved all of my friends when I was in high school. We were all really close and hung out all the time. And the moment I got married, that didn't happen anymore. I mean, I think maybe the first couple of years, like we would see each other here and there, but it was more like, now here's my person. And I don't really need to be friends with you guys anymore. You're great, but I don't really, you know, I have my person, he's my friend and he's my husband and we're going to do all these things together. And so, no, I would say that conversation wasn't being 
Was that modeled? Was that kind of just the way it was? Or was this the way that you thought it should be? I think it was more, this was the way I thought it should be. Mm -hmm. Um, My mom had a few friends and, you know, she would get together with her sister-in-laws. And and I think for me, that's kind of how, how I thought about it. Like, oh, well, my brother just got married and now that she, my sister-in-law is going to be like one of my best friends and my other sisters are great and I love them. And like, it will just be like, we'll just have the family friends. And, and don't, I don't really necessarily need these other friends that I, you know, had when I was in high school. Mm. Was that the case? Yeah. I mean, I'm friends with my family and I love them and they're great. But I think, you know, because we all believed the same thing and we all really felt like, being at home and supporting our husbands is the way to go. And not, not to say there's anything wrong with that. I'm really not, I don't want to bash yeah, motherhood no, I get it. for this decision at all in any way. I think it's amazing, but I also, you know, came to realize there is so much more when you put yourself as a priority. And I didn't know that at the time. So let's fast forward a little bit. Cause you and I had kind of a pre podcast powwow, right? Yeah. So I have some, I have some insight into your story. You've got two things going on here. You've got this marriage in which you're starting to look around and question, wait a minute, what about my happiness and and where does that come from? And if I'm pouring so much into someone else and that's kind of my role, whose job is it to pour into me? And even if I were me, I don't even know what I like, right? Mm -hmm. Or what's of interest to me over here on one side of the coin. On the other side of the coin, you have this very conservative upbringing that's very, very rooted in the community of the church. And I know based on our conversation, there was some questioning happening there as well. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about that. Yeah, it was it was actually originally my husband who started questioning and he actually decided to leave the church and didn't want to be a part of it any longer. And at first I was, I, that was very scary to me because you know, this is my whole life. My whole family is raised in it. And, and so for him to say, I'm stepping away from the church, it was like, what, (laughs) how can you even question that in that way? Because I had never questioned it in that way. I had taken everything that I had learned and I wouldn't even say that I questioned it on my own. I just accepted it as truth. Mm. And there was no questioning of maybe this isn't true. Maybe I should decide for myself whether this is true or not. I'm just going to accept it. And so when he stepped away, at first I was very scared. And then the more I would watch him, the more I, I started to question as well. So what were you seeing that was causing you to question? Well, it was almost like he was giving me permission in a way to, to, question my own thoughts and my own beliefs, which I think is an important part of being a human and not just taking everything at face value, but I had never really done that before. And so watching him, you know, not buy into all of the things that we learn in this religion of like, you have to get married young, you, you know, you have to raise kids in this specific way and they have to go to church and they have to get baptized and all these things. And, and, you know, watching him question those things with even our own kids, like, well, maybe they shouldn't get baptized and maybe they shouldn't be raised in this very conservative way. Maybe there are things that can add value to their lives and to ours that are outside of this little bubble that we kind of live in. And so watching him start to live in a different way, got me questioning myself and, is this important to me? Do I believe this thing? Do I believe this teaching? And if not, what does that mean for me? And so I got to a point where I realized there are things inside this religion that I don't agree with and that don't align with my values. And I started to recognize those things and decided also to step away. So now that's a big deal because it's not just you having this epiphany of, oh my gosh, I can think on my own and I can make my own decisions. And I, it's very empowering to be able to do so. Yeah. But you also have an entire extended family deeply rooted in the church. Yeah. So how was that? Was, was that an, uh, an easy discussion to have with them? You know, 
There were times and there still are times. I mean, my family is very loving and supportive and and I'm so grateful for their openness with me. Um, I don't know that I've ever actually had a sit down conversation with my parents one-on-one saying these, this is why I left. This is why I don't go to church anymore, but I know that they still, it, it hurts them because of their beliefs and where they're coming from. And this whole idea of being sealed, this, you know, Mormons believe that you are sealed together as a family and you're going to live forever, even after death together as a family. And so if someone leaves the church, they won't be a part of that any longer. And so for them, I know that they believe that wholeheartedly and that hurts to know that they won't be together with their entire family forever. Do you think it's hurt? Do you think it's fear? Do you think they have probably, fear for probably you? All of them. What yeah, your sure. afterlife could look like? Sure. I think I think all of those things are wrapped into one. So you make this ginormous decision to actually start thinking for yourself you make this epic move and you leave this church that's really been the foundation for all of your decision-making up to this point. Yeah. So what did that shift in you and what went on from there? Because it, I'm sure it didn't stay in a silo. I can only see it as like a Jack in the box, right? Like do, 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 do. And then the whole thing pops out. You can't really put it back in and it doesn't stay in a silo. It doesn't stay just within church. Now you're learning how to make these epic moves. What does life look like for you at that point? Yeah, I think it was, I think it was a slow progression for me, which is kind of how my life is. I am more slow to adopt new ideas and new beliefs. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And for me, it was just a a more slow progression of just questioning things and figuring things out. And so this was about 10 years ago, I think. I mean, the times probably are off a little, but um, so it took a little while for me to step into who I am and figuring out more about who I am. And within that progression was, you know, this breakdown of, do I want to stay married to this man? Mm. And what does that look like? And, and it's not like this happened overnight. Of course, you know, we had a pretty good marriage, but neither of us were very happy. And I think we both started to recognize that as we stepped out of the church. And then as we each started making more and more decisions on our own, we both started realizing she's not making me happy. He's not making me happy. What does happiness mean to me? And how can I create that on my own? And then you know, what does that look like for each of us individually? So what did that look like? Because, you know, now you're starting in what your thirties or your forties, right. To say, what is happiness? Yeah. What does happiness look like for me? What makes me tick? So how did you explore that side of yourself? How did you go through this? Yeah. So for me, happiness, that even that question of what makes me happy wasn't fully explored until I got to the place where I made the decision to ask for a divorce. Okay. And so I was at this during this time, I was still very much involved with like what are his hobbies, what does he want? Mm. You know, I was working from home very, very little. I was doing like part-time work, but it wasn't something that I enjoyed. It wasn't like I'm going to go after this career that I love and I'm going to create this in my life and he's going to do his thing and we'll figure that out. No, it was still like, Oh, you like to run. Okay. I'll go running as well. And then maybe we can connect on this run, which never would happen because I hated it so much and he loved it so much. And so, you know, I'm looking for all of these things and and he's doing so much with his life. He's working in Germany for months at a time on films and doing so much. And I'm home with the kids, which I love being with my kids but also I still felt very um, stagnant in my life and didn't really know which direction to go. So there is a lot of questioning going on of like, what will make me happy? And I'm trying a few, a business here and I'm trying this over here and nothing's really clicking. And can, you know, can this I ask you time, one our question? Relationship, yeah. This whole time our relationship is kind of devolving. So what's occurring to me is, I'm not saying you had never experienced joy before. I'm sure you had experienced joy, but what makes you happy 
is very different. It's yeah. it's what sparks me, what is of interest to me, where do I want to spend some of my time? What are things that fill my bucket? And it's so interesting because as I've been doing all kind of these pre-podcast powwows with different guests, potentially for the show, what you're talking about has been a running thing with a few women that I've spoken to. None of the men, by the way, I have some men guests coming on, but for the women, there seems to be this common theme of I've lost a sense of who I am Mm -hmm. and I don't even know how to find it. So how did you go about finding what sparked joy in you? Yeah, that's a really good question. So when we got to this point of should we or shouldn't we get divorced, because we both kind of were back and forth on it and neither of us would really make the decision, my very first step of figuring out, you know, getting in touch with my inner knowing was just being honest with myself. And I think you know, I, I, I can't remember if I told you this or not. I feel like I did, but I went for a walk one day just to clear my head and figure out what it was that I really wanted. And I did ask myself that I said, do you want, you know, what do you want in this relationship? And I think for the first time I was honest and I actually listened to that honesty instead of shoving it down. Like I had done so many times before. And I just said, I want a divorce. And immediately, like just a rush of peace and Mm. like calm came into my body. And I was just like, okay, that's, that's step one. And so it was taking that initial first step of just really being open to me and myself and my answers and my honesty and trusting that. I was going to figure it out. Like, it's not like that answer wasn't scary to me. It was, but -hmm. because I felt that peace, because I felt that calm and it was like an inner knowing that I don't know if I had ever felt that before or allowed myself to feel that before. That was the first step to being able to open myself up to finding my own happiness, finding my own joy. So I have a a handful of sayings that I, have been have coined over the years that I share with my clients often. And one of the sayings is know your truth and trust your knowing. So I think what you were saying really resonated with me because so often my clients do know the answers to the questions they're asking me. Mm-hmm. You know, my job is to never give answers. You know this, you're a yeah. coach. It's to help them find the answers they already have within them. And this idea of knowing your truth is one thing, right? You can know, but it's trusting yourself. Yeah. It's listening to it. It's trusting your knowing that if you think it and you feel it, it's okay to act on it. Yeah. And you got to really trust yourself because I think, unfortunately, as women, we've been somewhat indoctrinated to seek validation from other people yep. and not trust ourselves and have a lot of self-doubt. And so this idea of knowing your truth, but trusting your knowing and saying, I don't really need anybody else's validation of my truth in order for it to be real. Yeah. It's a huge first step. Yeah. Yeah. And it was for me a hundred percent because it was from there that I was able to start really diving into, okay, now what Karen, like, who are you Yeah, and what does life after this relation, the end of this relationship look like for you? What direction do you go? Who, you know, what do you enjoy? What makes your heart beat in such a, an amazing mm. way you know, what is it that you truly do want out of life and who are you moving toward in that life? So what did that look like? I mean, I'm literally thinking to myself, this is like, wow, I don't have to take anybody else's opinion into consideration on the next home that I have or the paint that I want to put on the wall or what I want to make for dinner. Yeah, You know, these are such fundamental things. Were those things that were kind of feeling foreign to you when you first started doing it? Not necessarily. I mean, there was some of that, like, you know, 
I, I had never <laughs> got, I had never signed up for like cable on my own. It, yeah. My husband had always taken care of that stuff. And so even, you know, dipping my toe into trusting that I could figure that out mm. and, and choosing the wrong company and they sucked and they were the worst. And then like having to deal with the aftermath of that and just figuring my footing out in so many different areas. But yes, yeah, so much, like so much of it was just like, okay, what do you like? What do you enjoy? And let's listen to some podcasts and let's read some books and let's go out with some girlfriends and, you know, live a life that you never actually experienced before. Have some and how friends, old go out are you? drinks and, you know, that how old are you at that point? At this point I was in my late thirties. I was like 38, 39. Okay. Yeah. So, and I think I often tell my, tell this to my clients in this specific way. It was almost like I flipped this switch of permission in Mm. my head of just like, I'm just giving you permission to do anything you want. And you're going to try a bunch of things. And if it feels good and you enjoy it, great. And if it doesn't amazing, you don't have to do that anymore. And you can say no at any time kind of a thing. And so I would just give myself permission to, you know, test the waters here and try this and, and not feel bad about making that decision, not feel bad about taking, you know, a couple nights away from my kids, which I had never done. And so, um, you know, not feel bad about trying to get to know people or going out with my friends or going to this paint class or listening to this podcast or not cooking for the kids one night and saying, hi, you're on your own tonight. You know, I'm doing this thing over here. I love you, but I need some mom time, you know, really giving myself permission to be me and not have to be full on conservative mom who doesn't really have a life and just constantly Mm. is taking care of everyone else at all times. Was there any point in time during this process? Cause it really is a full journey, right? Yeah. It's never done, but yeah. th- during this process, were there times where you're like, Oh shit, I made a mistake or I don't know what I'm doing, or this is harder than I thought it would be. Or I kind of want to go back to not knowing myself and not making decisions. Cause I'm scared. Yeah, I think the not making decisions part, yes, there's for sure, because there's a lot of pressure sometimes that we put ourselves with making the right decision. And so I think for sure, there have been times where I've been like, oh my gosh, I just don't want to do this anymore. But there wasn't ever a time where I questioned whether I was making the right decision with the divorce or not. Mm -hmm. It Mm -hmm. was even though it was hard and it was challenging and, you know, we, we actually have a really great relationship, my ex and I do, and we have pretty much the whole way through, not that it wasn't, you know, heartbreaking and it was, wasn't hard for our kids. And we've had to navigate how to make that relationship work and how to parent. And, you know, all of those things came into it. Like they do with all divorces, but there wasn't ever a time where I, you know, sat in my bedroom and thought, this might be the right decision. This might be the wrong decision. I don't, I don't know if I should do this. I, it was that I just always would go back to that inner knowing that I felt on that morning Yeah. Peace and just trusting you're going to figure it out. It might be hard and you might not know the next step and you might not, you, you know, know what direction it's going to take you, but you are going to figure it out. Did you have, because now this is like the second whammy for your family. Like, did you get any pushback from the family? Because I'm sure there's a lot of fear driving their emotion. You know, now you're leaving the church. You're not going to be sealed with the family. Now you're going to get divorced. This is not something our religion belongs in, you know, believes in. Yeah. Was there a lot of fear-based questioning? You know, there wasn't. And I really appreciate my family for being good to me in that way. I went Mm -hmm. when I was telling my family about the divorce. I have one sister who lives in Alaska. So she knew I had told her over the phone, but everyone else that is in my immediate family lives close to me, close enough that I can drive within an hour or so. And so I went to each family member individually and just told them face to face that I was getting a divorce because we'd been married for 20 years. You know, he, you know, Eric was part of my family. He still is part of my family, but this was a big deal. And so I went individually and every person 
was so loving and supportive. Mm. And there was one moment when I told my parents where my dad, you know, kind of just said, are you sure you don't want to go to counseling or try and work it out? Like maybe you can figure out how to make it work. And my mom just stepped in and said, no, if this is what she feels like she needs to do, then she needs to do it. And I really am so grateful to my family members for being that loving and supportive and just allowing me to be me. Allowing it's, me it's, to know that it was the right decision for me. Now, I don't know if after I left, they were, you know, what happened. But in the moment when it was me face to face with them, they were all very supporting and very loving. And of course, sad, but loving. Yeah. And I can tell you what I'm feeling in my chest. Because you can see, like, when people listen to this on a podcast, they won't see it. But I'm literally touching my chest. Because what I feel for you in that moment was... it in my mind, what I'm hearing is it's a God thing. It's almost like it was the, it was a perfect case scenario of the, of the compassion and love that you yeah. really needed. You weren't really seeking their permission, yeah. right? You had granted that permission to yourself, yep. but sometimes even once we've granted the permission from our, for ourselves, we want that warm embrace from our family that almost indicates I'm proud of you for, for thinking for yourself, for making this decision for yourself, for coming to this conclusion, recognizing it couldn't have been easy. I don't think anybody thought you were making a flippant decision. Yeah. Um, but there's in my, there's a grace in that is what I'm hearing in my head. Like it's a beautiful thing really, because it couldn't have been an easy decision. Yeah. And I'm sure it would have felt very uncomfortable if you were getting pushback, right? Yeah. Um, because you really do need people when you're going through a challenging experience like yeah. that. Yeah. And, you know, I am, as you mentioned before, I'm a coach and I coach other divorced women and they don't all, they don't always get that kind of support no. and love and, you know, recognition of this is your decision and I trust you to make your own decisions, which is what I felt from my family. Of course they were sad and of course they were disappointed, but they didn't project that onto me as we can't love you anymore. We can't support you. Mm. We can't, we can't walk with you through this. So you, you are a coach and I, you know, people always say to me, Oh my gosh, how can you have coaches on your show? Like, Everybody comes into the world with a scarcity mindset. I don't necessarily jive that way. I feel like everybody has a right to connect and there's plenty to go around, right? Yeah. So, you know, people that know me know my specialty is trauma. I do a lot with narcissism. So I do coach a lot of women either, you know, in a marriage that they're suspecting they're receiving narcissistic abuse or uh, on the other side of it, but it's traditionally, those are the clients that are brought to me, someone that's in that space. But I don't specialize in in divorce or confidence. And I know that you're a confidence divorce coach. So share with people what that looks like and how you serve people that way. Yeah. So more of my coaching is centered around really giving women that permission to love themselves and to Mm. step into their knowing and understand their worth and their value. Because so many women who go through a divorce, get to this space. And it happened for me too, of going, I don't like who I am. I don't know who I am. I don't want to be, I don't even know if I want to be with this person because I don't know who she is. And really going through that transformation of who are you? Your worth is, you know, constant and it's never changing And stepping into knowing that because so many women don't understand that about themselves. And so I just work with women for the most part who are going through a divorce, who get to that place of like, I don't know who I am and I don't know how to feel these emotions that I'm feeling. And I don't know where to go from here. And I don't even trust that I can live a good life after my marriage. They they often think my life is basically ruined and, you know, I'm going to be sad and lonely for the rest of my life. And I step in and teach them that's not the case. It's not true. You can have an amazing life even after a divorce. So can you give someone, can you give our audience an example of, you know, something you might take them through some sort of exercise or tip or trick that you might take them through when there is so much self-doubt and so much concern about their value and their worth? Yeah. Well, 
The very first thing that for me, I had to do, and I teach my clients this as well, is really changing the narrative in your head about you know, who you are. Because when you talk mean to yourself and you're constantly telling yourself that you can't do it, that you're not worthy, that you are stupid and you can't figure it out and nobody's going to love you, it's hard to like feel like you can have a good life at that point. Mm. And so when I was going through my divorce and I was going through this self-transformation, I recognized that I could, I had to stop listening to those voices, that voice in my head that was telling me you're the worst, you're going to be left behind and your ex is going to move on and he's going to have this amazing life and you're just going to be stuck here, you know, with nothing to live for. And so I told myself, you're going to just start telling yourself five things that you like about yourself every single day. And they have to be Mm. true. Can't just say, I'm a good person. You're, you know, I love you so much because in those moments I didn't believe that. (laughs) And so I just said, you're going to tell yourself five things that you like about yourself and you're going to do it every single day. And that's where I started. And I started with like, okay, you've got some pretty pretty hair. Your curls are great. You're a good mom. Mm. You know, you have a pretty collarbone. They were very like superficial, like, uh, but I had to start somewhere. And for the first about three weeks, I mean, I can't remember exactly because it was quite a few years ago, but for about the first three weeks, I said the same five things because Mm. I literally could not find anything else. And it was at that point where I started to like open myself up to, okay, now I can add this into like, I'm actually really good at waking up and starting my day off on a really good note. Or you know what I mean? Like I just started noticing more and more good things that I appreciated about myself. And that is what I teach my clients as well. It's one of the Mm. very first things that we do is they have to start changing that narrative in their head. Because otherwise when there's no change, change that's going to happen. I think it's beautiful. And I think it's a great exercise. Um, you know, I have a good friend that's a gratitude psychologist. And so she's constantly challenging people to think of five things they're grateful for. Yeah. But I love this. You know, I've also seen other coaches take this approach. And I'll be honest with you, it's not something I can get comfortable doing. But I have another friend that's a trauma recovery coach. And she really didn't love herself. And she would stand naked in front of a mirror until she could get comfortable doing it. Yeah. And looking at all parts of her and loving all parts of her and stopping with the self judgment. I mean, it's the self judgment that's the death, right? It's the death of us. What I find interesting is there is a difference between saying it and truly believing it. There is. Now, did you find yourself in this, in my mind, I'm thinking back because I'm uh, trained in the methodology called rapid transformational therapy and it's done in hypnosis. And, you know, sometimes when I've done this process with people, it's the core belief that I'm not enough or I'm not deserving or I'm not worthy that doesn't allow the thought to become true. Yeah. Right. You can say the words, but if that core belief is still running quarterback, yeah, it doesn't really matter. So if you have someone that's having a hard time because their core belief is contradicting the thought, if that makes sense, yeah. how do you help them shift the, the mindset on the core belief and finding their worth? Yeah. So what I normally have them do is I will say, you know, tell me just off the top of your head, some things that are really great about you. And I don't give them a lot of time to think about it. And they just have to name as many as they can think of. And we write them down. And I see, I say, those are the things that you believe to be true about yourself. Because they're coming, bam, 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 Mm -hmm. one right after the other. And those are the things that you need to start with. And it's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel weird at first. And you're probably going to say those things. And even though you just told them to me with no problem whatsoever, you're going to say them back to yourself when we're not together. And you're going to go, is that really true? But because you were able to come up with them like one after the other, you do believe them 
you just have to like start to recognize that you believe them. Well, it's, it's interesting. It's in that awareness and that, you know, you know, recognition of this is true about me and I can accept it as truth and I can use it as proof for myself. It's, it makes me think of like the old cartoons that we would see in the eighties where like you would have someone and you'd have the little devil on one shoulder and the mm-hmm. little angel on the other. Yeah. And I'm studying right now, internal family systems, which is all about parts work and understanding that we all walk with a ton of different parts in ourselves that either are working for us or against us. Yeah. Right. And, um, you know, sometimes when we have that belief, which to me would be like the little angel, that's like, yeah, I am good enough. Yep. And then you have that quick little thought of like, are you sure about that? Yep. You know, it's almost like this other part is moving in. It's the challenger or the questioner Mm -hmm. as a way to protect you from making a mistake or getting too vain or whatever you've learned is not okay. Right. Every part thinks it's doing a job for you. Yeah. Every part thinks its job is to be your BFF. Even the parts that are saying to you, uh, 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 I, I, no, I don't think you should think that about yourself. And actually yep. you're not that good and yep. you're not that great. <laughs> and so it's good for people to understand that when those, you know, I like to call it the itty bitty shitty committee. <laughs> I love that. Right. And I literally imagine it like a whole bunch of like little minions, like we're going to tell her um, when that little itty bitty shitty committee comes in and tries to squash and silence that confidence. Yeah. Right. Um, They actually think they're doing a good thing. Yeah. There's yeah, no they're trying to protect you in some way. You. Yeah. 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 And I find it fascinating when, when people are so struggled with it, we try to, you know, in, in IFS, you would really, instead of trying to get rid of it, you would give it a voice and say, why do you keep coming up? Yeah. I love why, that. Why do you keep coming back? Let's, let, let's have a dialogue with mm-hmm. you and try to figure out what role are you playing for Karen? What right. kind of job do you have for her? What do you think you're doing that's that that's a benefit and allow that part to really be heard? Yeah. Give it a different role. Yeah, I love that. Right. I love that. So I know um, you have your own coaching and I'm just going to put it up. So for people that are watching us on the um online. I have to edit this one. Hold on a second. Your website is Karen Nelson coaching. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for people that want to find you, how can people find you? So a couple of different ways. I do have my own podcast as well. It's called becoming you again. And I think that's where that's the thing that has been growing the most rapidly because it is geared specifically for divorcing or separated or divorced women, you know, women who are going through that stage of their life. And of course, everything I teach on there and talk about on there can be, you know, used in whatever kind of way, whatever your situation is, but all of the examples that I give and the women that I'm actually talking to are going through a divorce or are divorced. Love it. And so that is called Becoming You Again, and it's on all of the platforms, wherever you like to listen to podcasts. That is where I would say go to dip your foot in to just reconnecting with yourself, really, you know, understanding emotional resiliency and Mm. stepping into your own kind of independence after divorce. And then, of course, you can always go to my website, which is Karen Nelson Coaching, and I'm on Instagram at Karen Nelson coaching and then Facebook as well. That's awesome. And do you have anything, if somebody's really interested in your story, if somebody really resonated and says, Oh my gosh, this is my story. Um, do you offer any kind of free discovery call or any kind of consult? Yeah, I do. I have a 30 minute free discovery call and you can do that either. I mean, all of the places there's links at on the show notes of my podcast. You can go to my website and click the link to schedule. You can go to my Instagram and click the bio to schedule. And so that is for anyone who really just wants to come and 
see if we would be a good fit. You kind of come and talk about your problem and I tell you how I think I can help you. And like you said, not everybody works for everybody. You know, there's so so many people out there who want to help, who are willing to help, who want to step into that role, but not every, I'm not for everyone and everyone's not for me. And this is a great way for us to figure out whether or not we would be a good fit together. And I think there's nuances here, right? Like, unless you've been in a very conservative, fundamental religion, I, I was not raised in that. I wouldn't understand the puts and takes of that. Yeah. You know, and if even if somebody came to me and this was a really, really big part of it for them, I yeah. might refer them out to somebody like yourself who has that intimate experience right. where you may not have intimate experience with narcissistic abuse, yeah. but this is kind of part of my wheelhouse. So I think it's really always important as coaches as well that we kind of work as a village, right? Our yeah. job is to heal people. Our job is to be guides and mentors to people on their journey. And sometimes people are going to get into pieces of their journey that we may or may not have expertise in. And I think it's, um, it's really smart to say, you know what, I have somebody that I want you to talk to because this is your experience. And I think there's something that you can learn from each one of us. And as coaches, of course, we're always learning from each one of our clients as well, right? Um, So as we round out, I have a couple of, you know, quick little fiery questions. One is, you know, one of my missions is to really offer support to people and not everybody can afford a coach. And I know when I had my latest breakdown, which led to my biggest breakthrough Mm. 2012, I did not have the money for a coach. I literally had somebody's number for two years that I knew was going to be a good person for me. She was kind of more of like a spiritual guide. I couldn't afford her because I was in a financial crisis, but I went to the library and I listened to podcasts Mm -hmm. and I watched YouTube and I, I found so much growth and so much personal development just in these things. So my quick question for you is, can you name a book, a podcast, or a YouTube channel that kind of made an an impact in your journey that you can share with people as a low or no cost resource? Absolutely. There was one in particular, a book that it was the same thing for me. Like I, when I was going through my divorce, I didn't really know where to turn. I didn't have, you know, tons of funds and I didn't even know about life coaching at the time. So it wouldn't have mattered because I didn't know what that was, but I, I love to listen to books on audible. And so I was just buying book after book after book. And there was one specifically that spoke to my soul and Mm. really started shifting the way I thought about things. And it's by Jen Sincero. And it was actually called You Are a Badass at Making Money. It wasn't even her first book. It was her second book. I have it here. Yeah. Yeah. And and I had never heard of her. I had never thought about life in this way of like, I have way more control over my life than I'm giving Mm. myself credit for. And just that book, I listened to it over and over and over again, like during the first probably, I don't know, four or five months of, you know, this transition of separation from my husband. And it changed my life. And I still, to this day, you know, you are a badass, that book, both of those, both of her first two books, just, I I was still listening to them. I just listened to you are a badass like a month ago, because it's such an important way of thinking about yourself, thinking about the world and really stepping into your own power as a human being, as a woman. I love it. I love it. For me, it was Brene Brown's Daring Greatly. Uh, yes, love. You know, I yes. was really at an extremely low point um, in the fall of 2012. And it was very circumstantial. You know, it wasn't a situation where like I had deep depression or I had deep, in- I had crazy anxiety because the things environmentally that were happening in my mm-hmm. space were very, very stressful um, for the average person. But I, had so much additional trauma I had never dealt with appropriately, Mm -hmm. even though I had been through 25 years of therapy, um, that my reaction to the stress was so overwhelming to my system. Mm -hmm. I couldn't function. And uh, somebody had recommended Brene Brown, Daring Greatly specifically, had just come out 
So this was in 2012, it was 10 years ago. And I was not a reader where I told myself, that was the story I was telling myself, oh, I wasn't a good student, I don't read, but I got it. There was something in me that just, I went and got it and it changed my life. Mm -hmm. It was like eating the best slice of chocolate cake I have ever had in my life. I couldn't stop reading it. I Mm -hmm. felt so seen, so understood. She put language to things that I had felt so deep in my gut for so long that I didn't know how to explain. And it was shocking to me because I felt like she was in my head. Yeah. Right. So when you get into one of those books, like for you, it was You're a Badass by Jen Sincero. For me, Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. And both of them have podcasts. Yep. Both of them have YouTube channels. So I think it's a great recommendation. And so if someone ends up catching this on the replay, um, I strongly encourage you, if you find yourself in a similar situation to what Karen is in, and you can't afford a divorce coach mm-hmm. or a confidence coach right now, yet, yet being the key word. Yep. There's so many resources out there. We're so lucky to have all this technology at our fingertips. Hit a library, grab it, buy it if you can afford it. Um, but I strongly, strongly recommend to everybody, there's so many resources out there that are free. Agreed. Awesome. So thank you so much. It was so wonderful having you on as a guest. Again, if anybody is interested in learning more about Karen, her website is karennelsoncoaching.com. She can be found on social media at Karen Nelson Coaching. Her podcast is Becoming You Again, and her recommendation is You're a Badass by Jen Sincero. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you catch this on the replay and you want to leave a comment on our live broadcast, you can do so. And we would be very happy to answer all of your questions. Thanks so much, guys. 